It couldn't be more true that he loves us the way that kids have been studying their memory verses has really put into perspective over the last week or so how true that is. How much, how much sometimes we look over that fact of love and we as people get caught up in doctrine or a theology or something that's deeper than the basic understanding of a child. That he loves us. And he did what he did at Calvary. That he was agonized at Gethsemane. That he went to the cross for us because he loved us. Not because he had to. Not out of a sense of duty or obligation. Not because he was made to do so. It was a purpose that he fulfilled, but he wasn't made for that purpose. He stepped into that role. He stepped up to the plate when it mattered, but he did it out of love. And he is a very special and extraordinary man because he's not just a man. He's 100% man and 100% God, and that's something that we have a hard time wrapping our minds around because we don't have anything to compare that to. But that doesn't negate what he did because he said the spirit is willing. That's the God part. But the flesh is weak. That's the man part. But he tells us, and we learn all through scripture, that, that he, what we see as weakness, he uses as strength. So when we admit that we're sinners, when we admit and acknowledge the fact that we have fallen and will fall again, that he was hung on that cross, because of my sin, because of my mistakes. Every time I make a mistake, it's like I'm hammering the nail in his arms myself. When we admit that, we can begin to live <coughs> loved because he did what he did to forgive us. He said on the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. That extends not just to the people that were hanging him there and that were the Roman soldiers and the Jews that were calling for his crucifixion, but that extends to us as well. Because he tells us, like we've been studying in 1 John, that we are his children. When we call on his name, we are his children. And we are loved because we're his children. You can be angry at your child. You can be disappointed at your child. But that never changes the fact that you love them. And that is, that is what God does, is he loves us. And Jesus is the manifestation, the physical embodiment of that spiritual love. If you would, would you go with me to the Lord's Prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you love us. We pray that this morning we, we study your word and it breathes life into our hearts. That you help us let go of whatever grudge or bitterness or, or, or pain that we're holding on to. That you help us learn to love and to be loved. Help us learn to love because we are loved. Help us feel Truly feel inside a peace and a comfort that only comes from your love. Speak life into each and every one of us. Help us take what we, we learned here this morning and use it to share that love with other people, especially those who don't know you yet. We pray for all those who were mentioned this morning on our prayer list and all those who are silent prayers in our hearts. We pray for the lost, that in some way you lead us to them or someone else to them who can who can shine a light on their life that is you, that their lives will point them toward you and hopefully they can be saved. We want to make disciples of all nations starting right here at home. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. This morning, we're in uh, 1 John chapter 3. We're going we're gonna to talk a little more about love. Last week was, was Valentine's Day and we talked about what, what God says love is, what he, how he defines love. And this morning, we're going to talk a little bit more about, um, now that we know what that love is, what does that really mean for us? What does it really mean to be loved and, and to give love? And starting in, in verse 1, and I'm going to read uh, from the, the New International Version, because they use a word that I really want to key in on. Um, in the King James, the same word is bestowed. But I'll, I'll read it in the New International, and you'll, you'll, see, you'll see which word it is. He says, in verse 1, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. 
And that is what we are. The reason this world does not know us is that it did not know him. And in the King James, and I think in the New King James as well, that word lavish is, is translated bestow. And they're, they're interchangeable, but the reason I wanted to, to chose lavish this morning is because that's not necessarily a word that we use very often in our vernacular. Bestowed isn't, isn't either. You know, like, come eat dinner, mother has bestowed food upon us. <laughs> you know, I don't say that very often. I also don't say, look, look, children, what the mighty food mother has lavished for us. You know, these aren't words that we use. It'd be cool if we did. You know, I'd get your attention if I said that at the dinner table. But what, what lavish means in this context, it, to me, it just speaks so much more to my heart that I've been lavished love rather than bestowed. Like bestowed gives this um, impression that here's the thing that you've been given and you should be so thankful that you've been given it. And that is true. But lavish says it in a different way. Here, here are some synonyms for lavish. As an adjective, lavish is excessive, extravagant, extreme, inordinate, and undue. See what great love the Father has undue you, has extreme for you, something that's extraordinary that you don't deserve. See what great love he's given. As a verb, some synonyms are heap, pour, rain, or shower. To get the opposite, some antonyms, some opposites for what this word means is moderate, temperate, or modest. It's not a normal thing that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. It's not something that we should ever glance over because we use the word love so so often in our language that it doesn't carry the kind of weight that it should, especially when we talk about Jesus Christ. Especially when we talk about the love that the Father has given us through Him. It doesn't, it just doesn't carry the weight that it should. So we use words like lavish. That means extreme, extravagant, excessive, over and above. That's what Jesus was. He was over and above. Love. So because of that, how do we live? How do we live in a world that doesn't know us, for one, and when they do know us, they hate us? Because Jesus told us about that. They will hate you because they first hated me. And John, the apostle of love, tells us here, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So how do we live in a world that doesn't know us or hates us with this love and share it? Well, this love that God has lavished upon us has given us three very important things. First, because we are lavished, lavishly loved by God the Father, we are given some very important look-alike features. And we're all image bearers of God. He created all man in his image. Now that's important to study too because you'll want to go back to, to Genesis 1 because he says, let us create them in our image plural, because we know who was with God when he was creating everything. Jesus. He was the word. He was the light of the world. He was the thing that by all things were created. So we have, we are image bearers of God. Where people fail as sinners is they take God's image and they distort it and they pervert it. And we're all guilty of it. When we sin, we are a flawed version of what God created. That's what happened in the garden. When, when the serpent tempted Eve and she fell. And we're very hard on Adam and Eve. We are. All of us are. Because we all look at that and say, man, if they had just got that right, we'd all be in the garden right now. We wouldn't have to work. The ground would just pop up food for us. You know, it would be fantastic. But the truth is, any one of us would have done the exact same thing that they did. Because if any one of us are better than them, then we, we're without sin. John has already told us that anybody without sin, that says that without sin is a liar. You know? We would have all fallen. We're no better. So we, we, we know that. But now, as followers of Jesus Christ, when we say his name, not just God, ambiguous, and not just I'm a spiritual person, very ambiguous, when we call on Jesus Christ's name, and we say we're his followers, 
we're given some lookalike features in the way that we live. First, we are being transformed into his image. And when Jesus returns, we will be like him. That's what John says in, in verse 2. He says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we will know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. When Jesus came back, this is, this is theological and I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. But when Jesus raised from the dead, how was he raised? He came back, physical, but, but also not. Sometimes they could recognize him. Sometimes they couldn't. Sometimes he would come through the door. Sometimes he would just show up. And then he had some physical attributes too. He showed Thomas the holes, the scars that he had. So the question becomes, uh, for a lot of people, what does that mean we're going to be like in heaven? Am I going to be, is everybody going to be about 30-ish? You know, when we get there, because that's, that's, about, that's about peak, prime time, you know? Is everybody going to be, uh, are we going to have the scars that we have from the way that we die? I mean, Jesus did. All we know is that we're going to be like him, whatever that means. And that's good enough for me. That's good enough. We walk by faith and not by sight. Not blind faith, but we walk by faith knowing that whatever God has planned for us, it's going to be all right. It's going to be the way that it's meant to be. Maybe, who knows? I mean, I can, I, we could do that all day long. Maybe it'd be like this, maybe it'd be like that. Whatever it's going to be like, we know it's going to be good. Because when God created the garden, what did he say? He's good. And then when he created man, he said, he's very good. We are very good in his eyes. And when we turn back to the way that he made us to be, when we become what Jesus became because of the resurrection, because of our belief, it'll be exactly the way God wants it to be. We are purified just as Jesus is pure. John chapter 3, verse 3 says that. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. I'm pure even though I feel wretched because I know me. God's not going to see that part. Or he is going to see it. He's going to ignore it. Because we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus on that day is going to say, pay no attention to those sins. This one's with me. And God promised that he would honor that. He would do that very thing. We are made righteous just as Christ is righteous. 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. He tells us, little children. Now remember, this is John probably 100 years old. 90 to 100 years old. So this is Grandpa John writing 1 first, first John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He's been around. He's already been, they tried to kill him and couldn't. And then he was exiled to Patmos. And then he was released. Eventually he was released. And he got to live out his days uh, as an elder in the churches. And, and he wrote these, these letters to leave a legacy. He already written the gospel of John. And then Revelation. And then he wrote these. They believe that these are his last works. And maybe the very last works of the New Testament. So this is, this is Grandpa John. If Grandpa John's going to leave us with any kind of love and and knowledge this is what he says little children let no one deceive you he who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous we try to practice righteousness we try to be right but we don't we don't want to be holier than thou you've ever heard that term where we're constantly pointing out other people's faults because I'm doing right you should be doing what I'm doing you don't see it the way I see it, you're wrong. Because what did Jesus teach? He said, don't, don't try to pluck out the, the splinter in your brother's eye until you pull a log out of your own. That's, we can't focus on who we are and how, how we're righteous. We're not righteous by anything that we do. We practice righteousness. But it's because of Jesus that we're righteous. It's because of him that we're pure. It's because of him that we can even say we're going to heaven. A lot of people think it's arrogant to say that we're going to heaven. Somebody says, are, are you, you believe you're going to heaven? I do. Well, look at you. Don't you think you're an arrogant person? How do you know how, how God is going to judge you? Because I, I know what the Bible says. Because I know the Bible says he's not going to judge me. He's not going to judge me because I'm with, I'm with Jesus. If I'm with him, he's judging me based on Jesus. And Jesus paid my debt. Jesus paid my fine. That's the, that's the second thing. That John tells us here. Because we are God's beloved children, we receive physical and spiritual transforming benefits. Transforming is the key word there. That it changes us. 
It's not an accessory to our lives. I, was, I got the chance again, thank goodness, to speak at Teen Challenge on Friday, and it's one of the things that I told the guys down there is Christianity will not fix your life. It is not meant to do that. It's meant to change it. It's not a fix. It's not something you can put in your pocket and carry with you and pull it out like a debit card when you need it. It's not that. It's something that should change every single one of us. And what that means is when you go home, that's what I was telling them, when you go home, people are going to say, man, you ain't the same person I knew. And you should be able to say, you are exactly right. I am not. I am in here. I am the same person. And unfortunately, I still struggle with the same things that I used to struggle with. But I'm not the same person. I am different. Not because anything I did, because I met a guy. Let me tell you about him. His name is Jesus Christ. And he changed me. He didn't solve my problems. He didn't fix everything, but he saved my life. And that is, that's what Christ is supposed to do. It's transforming. In this way, Christ takes away our sins. John 3, 16. 1 John 1, 9. 1 John 2, 12. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 8. And then here, in 1 John 3, 5, he tells us that we know that he was manifested to take away our sins. He came to this earth to do that very thing. It wasn't why he was created. It wasn't that Jesus was this special uh, God needed a scapegoat so he made Jesus and sent him to do the deed. He came on his own. He was there in the beginning. He was the word and the light by which everything was made through and he gave up his glory for us to do that thing, for that purpose. Because we know that God can destroy the world and he has before. He wiped out everybody in Noah's day except for Noah. And then we were given a second chance after Noah. And what did we do with it? We absolutely flubbed it up. Failed miserably. Even after he chose Israel, set them apart. It's the, the whole story of the Old Testament. And he could have done the exact same thing. He could have just cast down fire and brimstone like I saw in Gomorrah and gotten rid of the whole lot. But Jesus stood up and said, no, I'll go. And I'll take it. So because of that, we are transferred from death and rebirthed into a new life. And this is all stuff that we've heard before. And where do we hear it? From John. This is stuff that he's been preaching since the minute that he knew that Christ had raised from the dead. As soon as, as soon as that happened, John became outspoken. Remember, he's a son of thunder. Him and James, they were boisterous and loud. This is the same disciple the apostle loved who wanted to cast down fire on the town in Samaria that didn't want to accept Jesus in for the teaching. He said, should we cast down fire on them? And Jesus is like, seriously? I'm here for love. I'm here not to destroy men or condemn them, but to save them. And, and this is what he's telling us, 1 John 3, 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. That's a tough one. It's a tough one to talk about because it implies if you're born of God, you will not sin. Because you cannot sin. But yet I sin. And, and I fail. So what does that mean? Does that mean that my does that mean that my salvation is in jeopardy every time I sin? Paul said that he knows what's right and knows what's wrong and knows he should be doing right, but does wrong anyway and cannot understand it. And I'm right with Paul. I don't understand why my flesh is so weak. I don't understand why I can't make my heart do what the Bible tells me it should do. But the heart, the Bible tells me that the heart is exceedingly wicked. And that where does sin come from? That's the real thing. That's the real thing to study is sin is not an outside thing. It's not something that's out here floating around. And there, you know, there are temptations in the world and the devil knows he can't read our minds, but he can read the signs. And he knows where we struggle and he picks at those places. He's smart like that. The funny thing about sin, not funny, but the ironic thing is, sin starts right here. Sin proceeds from desires of the, of the heart. So the struggles that we have, they're self-made. They're self-created. We joke all the time about the kids. I, I love them with all my heart, but nobody told us, this is all y'all's fault. Nobody told us when we were going to have kids that our job was basically to keep them alive despite their best efforts to kill themselves. Because that's what they want to do every day. Every day is kill themselves in a different way. Stop that. What's wrong with you? You know, nobody told us that. They create their own problems, don't they? 
most of the time, I just want to say, why are you even arguing over that toy? Who cares? There's 15 other toys you can play with. Why do you want the one that had been sitting in the corner collecting dust for a week, and now that he has it, you want it? What's the deal? They create their own problems. They're just a young, innocent, sweet manifestation of us. We create our own problems. We do. But what we should remember is that we have been transferred into a new life, rebirthed and forgiven for the problems that we create and for the sins that we, we make. He says in John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life. I'm secure in the fact that my spirit, my soul, will rest in eternity because of Jesus Christ. I may die, I will die, I may die, and maybe I will, maybe I will. Yeah, yeah, of course I'm going to die. I'm going to die here, but I'm going to live forever with him. I'm secure in that. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. That means we're different. We're different. We bear a new image. When we fail, it hurts us more. It hurts us more than the world. What the world does is they take their failure and they try to justify it as the right thing to do or the new moral north. This is right now. Society says that this is okay, so everybody can do it. Government, the law, the law has been rewritten and this is now legal. Just because man's law or society says that it's okay does not mean that it is. God's law, his truth, trumps everything that we, we are, we are terrible at governing ourselves and we are terrible at being leaders. We, as people, not just us, you know, but people in general. History shows that absolute power corrupts absolutely. We're just not good to each other. I heard, a, I heard a thing, I think I've shared this before, but I'm going to share it one more time, where there was a, a famous apologist who was giving some kind of talk, and a kid got up, a college student, and he said, you seem like you're so afraid that the world is going to go to hell in a handbasket if we let people do what they want to do. He said, it's not going to do that. People are inherently good. People take care of themselves. Nobody's going to harm anybody if we just, you know, let go of all this uh, dogma and all this stuff that you're holding on to. He said, you know, you shouldn't, the world's not going to implode on itself. And the guy got up and he said, he said, you really believe that? Something like this. And, and he said, he said, yeah. He said, so you, you feel safe? He said, yeah, absolutely. He said, do you love your door tonight? Well, yeah. I said, why? Are you afraid that the world that you think you live in isn't, the, isn't real? Why are you not afraid? Of somebody? What's somebody not afraid? Of? Yeah, exactly. So the fake world that you're trying to create in your mind, it's not real. The real, we live in the real world. We're realists as Christians. We see the fact that we are, that everything has an end, a physical end, and we're planning for after that. We have a hope in a future that's everlasting, that will not end. Everyone is going to have to live in that world. Which side of heaven are we going to be on? That's, that's the difference between us. We're different from the rest of the world because we've acknowledged that. And we've called on Jesus' name and trusting in him to believe that, that we are made new. 1 John chapter 2, we've read this already. Verses 5 through 6 says, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And by this we know we are in him. When we call on his name and we live for Christ, he lives in us. He is what gives us life. He is what gives us forgiveness. He is the reason that we do not sin or practice righteousness or are pure. It's because of Him. God's love turns our self-condemnation into confidence. When we do fail, as we do, we get down. We, it's so easy to get down on ourselves. So easy to go to God, and I do this. I'm very guilty of this. I'm going to God and saying, God, I'm not worthy to do the things that you're calling me to do. I shouldn't be where you have me. And I know you are a very busy man. You have so much else going on. There's so many other things in the world that you, you don't have time for this, but I've got this little prayer. I've got this little thing I need help with. It's not how he wants us to pray. Read any of the Psalms. 
I, we've been studying the Psalms on Wednesday nights. I'm telling you, the one thing that got me when I started reading Psalms is I, by like the third one, I thought to myself, am I allowed to talk to God like this? Because David is. I don't feel comfortable talking to God the way David does. But it's sincere and it's true and there's no holding back. And that's, that's how God wants us to talk to him. Is he wants the real us, not the Sunday us. Not, not the, the part of us that we put on a good face, but he wants the part of us that's lonely, that's tired, that's frustrated, that's sick. He wants us to pray without ceasing. When we do, we can go from the self-condemnation of I'm not good because I'm a failure to wait a minute, I'm made good because of what Jesus did. Help me be better next time. And the more we pray that way, the more confidence we can have that we represent him, that we're a better image bearer of who he is. And lastly, we're not only called to be that image bearer in, in words and in speech, but we're called to live it out, to live it out expressively in a, in a tangible way. That's the thing that the world's missing, is we've got a lot of talk. And it is. Christianity, a sermon, uh, a good hymn song or a good worship song, they're great and they can move. But it seems like the world is really missing something that they need to hold on to. They need something physical to hold on to because they're lost in their ideas. How do we do that? How do we give them something physical? We do what Jesus called us to do and we love one another. That is the right thing to do. We are called to do what's right and love one another. First John chapter 3, verses 10 through 11 says, This is how we know the children of God, who the children of God are, and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. The Gospel of John Jesus' own words in chapter 13, verse 34 say this, A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. That gets people's attention, the way we love one another. Do they want to be in the world that we have created in the church? If they don't see us love one another, and we're just like the world, we said, uh, just heard it yesterday, very wise person, if you look like the world and you sound like the world, you're probably of the world. We are different, so we're called to be different. We're called to put on our Sunday best on Sunday morning because of that fact, because we stand out. We're called to do things like we're going to do here this morning and obey the commandments that Jesus gave us because we are different. And we're supposed to stand out. But even more than that, we're supposed to love one another when it's tough. When it's tough to love one another. When we don't agree. The churches, all churches this year, this past year, have been divided over small things. And we need to come back together and unite so that the world sees love. It's really going to get bad when, they, when, it, it, when it really gets bad someday. And I never know what it's going to be. And if we're persecuted like the rest of the world is persecuted and... Our faith becomes costly. It's really going to cost us something when they see us love one another and pray for our persecutors. That's different. That's what the first century church did, second century, third century. All the way up to now, that's how the church grew was because they loved us. It was because they fought back, because they were more educated, because they knew scripture. It was because they loved from the youngest child and, and, and the simplest housewife to the laborer to whoever. Everyone who made a lasting impact on the church after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension into heaven, they sacrificed for love. We are called to live that way, sacrificially for others. That's costly. It's not easy. But we do it because Christ sacrificed for us. 1 John 3.16, which is a remnant of John 3.16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. 
He's asking a lot of us right there. A lot of a lot of faith, a lot of a lot of Christian churches, they really they preach prosperity and progressiveness and, and love means happiness. Love means do what feels good and makes you happy. But what true love is, the way that Jesus Christ explained and expressed what love is for us is sacrifice and it's costly. So all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ and everything will be okay. Not true. You believe in Jesus Christ and that changes you and he may call on you to give your life for him. So you, I don't have to do anything to be a Christian. You may. You very well may. You better get that fact right is, is what you know, I'll tell myself. Get that right now. Do you have enough? What I asked the guys at, at Team Challenge, and I don't mean to spell it out again, but do you have enough faith to be a Christian without your Bible? If they arrest me, you, they arrest us and throw us in a dungeon and don't give us scripture and keep us down there for I don't know how many years, you know? Then stay faithful. Is it imprinted on my heart, imprinted on your heart enough to believe through all of that? Is it imprinted on our heart enough? Is it in our soul enough that I believe that they can take it away? But it's never going to change who Jesus is in my life because he changed me. Because I will lay down my life for my brothers and sisters because that's what he did. And that's what he's called me to do too. If I love him. So we're called to put this love into action. Not simply words. 1 John 3.18 says, Dear children, let us not live, I'm sorry, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. We are called to keep God's commands and do what pleases Him. 1 John 3.22-24 says, Whatever we ask from Him, we will receive because we keep His commands and do what pleases Him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has commanded us. The one who keeps his commands lives in him, and he in them. As we, as I ask the deacons if they would come up and, and prepare the communion, I want to, everybody kind of sort of knows my, my testimony a little, a little bit, and, and I'm not big on sharing because it's not, it's not a big Ordeal. But I'll tell you something that was very key for me when Jesus Christ came into my life. It happened because of two things. The first thing was there was a person that was introduced to me in my life that lived out the gospel truth. Never, she never made me do something or go somewhere I didn't want to go or, or profess a faith in something I didn't have. Uh, but she lived in a way that made me want to live a better way. If there's if there's anybody that hasn't been uh, if there's anybody that hasn't been served communion and wants to, if you would raise your hands so they know who needs it and who doesn't. So I started living I started living a different way, and the more I changed, the more I realized that was because of Jesus, and the more I felt guilty about who I was. The second thing that really pushed me over the edge, that really made me stand up, walk down the aisle, ask to be baptized, was the fact that when communion was passed around at church, when we would visit church, they were very big on, on these, these, this verse here, these verses. I'm going to read them. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 27 through 32. And I'm going to read from the New, uh, of the New International Version. It says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in any unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. When they would pass around the communion plates and the, and the cups, I would, I, I 
felt convicted to let it go by. I didn't feel worthy. I had not been saved. I believed in Jesus. I believed in Jesus in my heart, but I hadn't stood up to give a confession. I hadn't done any of that. And so I let it go by. And every time that it did, every time that that happened, I got closer and closer to wanting to be saved until finally I couldn't take it anymore and I got up. And I walked down the aisle and I was saved. This is a very, it's a very serious thing that we do when we take this. Jesus tells us to do this to remember what he did. And like we talked about this morning, love cannot be passed over. It's lavish what he did. It's extraordinary. And we have to remember it. So as we as we get ready to, to do this, I'll pray that everyone examines their hearts and, and asks the Lord's forgiveness for wherever it is that we need forgiveness for, as all of us do. Before I, I, I read the, the scriptures, if you would, go with me to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lavish love that you have given us, and we, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from ourselves. We pray that all of us here are not found wanting, but that our hearts are clear, our minds are at ease, and that we do this holy ordinance in remembrance of your sacrifice and what you've done for us, and that all of us feel not self-condemned, but confident in our everlasting life because of your saving grace. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, says, For I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, if you would. And in the, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This this communion that we do, as often as we do it, is, is extremely special. I, I, I do, I want to mention that the, the first churches, after Jesus' ascension, after his teaching, the disciples and the apostles, they began these over meals with family. Everyone is encouraged very much to remember this 
over a meal, a Sunday lunch or a Sunday dinner when your family comes over, to take a minute just to pause and say, let's, let's have communion as a family. That's, that's something that we should do more often so that the world sees what we do. It would be awesome if they could see us do that at a restaurant. I didn't see that very often before COVID happened, but I'm praying that after, now that this is, is coming to an end, I hope, that maybe we'll step up and do more of that. But, but again, that's not to take away what we do here because this ceremony, this celebration, while it is traditional and it is liturgical, there's nothing wrong with that. And this is, for many people, myself included, something that we do that gets us out of the chair and gets us down to the altar and makes us kneel before Jesus Christ and say, you're right. I need you. It's more than just, it's more than just a I hope I'm okay kind of prayer and walking out the door and never doing anything. It's a, I'm going to come down in front of everybody and admit that I should be condemned for who I've been. And that I want to leave my shame and my guilt here because I'm tired of this plate passing by me. And I'm tired of everybody looking at me and knowing that I'm a failure and I'm a sinner and I haven't admitted it yet. This is something that does that for people. Our lives is another thing that does that, the way that we live. Not that we walk around pointing fingers and condemning people, but that we live a loving life, joyful life, and that whatever it is that's in us makes us different. They say, man, that guy is different. Yes. And that may not be a good thing for a long time. Or pretty soon they might say, you're different enough to go to jail. And I'm going to say, yes, I am. Yes, I am. And I hope, I hope that all of us can say that. That there's enough evidence for all of us to be convicted of being Christian. I believe there is. I really do. Does anyone have anything they'd like to say to the church? Uh, a testimony, a praise, a prayer, anything whatsoever. This is a good time for it. If there's not, uh, would anybody like to volunteer to close our service today? If not, go with me to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've done. We pray for joy and peace over each one of us that we leave here happy and encouraged, knowing that we're confident. We're confident in the eternal salvation that you've given us, that our souls are set free, that we're no longer slaves to sin, but that we live a life full of light, and that we know that the, the darkness cannot overcome it, because... Greater is he who is in me. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We know that it is you that is in us. We pray that we've done what you have called us to do and continue to do what you call us to do. That you give us strength to do that with courage and boldness. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. God bless you all so much. Thank you.